Isa. Sige, Grace. Sige, Amira. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Tori Smith here, my wife, Chanel Smith, and we want to welcome y'all to the discussion. Um, we have a special guest, an amazing host, Ms. Ramona Mershon from Trauma Informed LA. She's here to help us moderate this conversation. Obviously, we're all here because of the recent events and everyone being willing to listen and open their ears and their hearts to discuss the uncomfortable conversations, which about racism in America. Um, I personally, I, I hate saying that it's an uncomfortable conversation because it's something that when you deal with it, it's not an uncomfortable conversation because you're talking about your reality. Um, but I appreciate everyone having it because it isn't a conversation that happens in most homes, really publicly in a lot of places. And um, I think we're at a spot right now where we can all grow as people and as a country. Um, want to pass the mic to Miss Ramona. You didn't let me room. say hi. You didn't say hi. Hey everyone. <laughs> yeah, I wanted <laughs> to say hi to everybody. Um, as you all know, this started as really just a Instagram conversation. Um, we built a lot of relationships via social media. Some of the people on there, I feel like, are fr family and friends. And so these conversations started on Instagram and turned into this. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, I know personally, there's a lot of people who are super excited to learn and grow. And to be able to do this together is going to be fun for me. Um, and I'm super excited to start this journey with you guys. It's weird because we can't see anybody. And so um, it's a little awkward just looking at ourselves right now, but bear with us. And Ms. Rona, I'm sorry, you can introduce yourself. Okay, we're good. Hi, my name is Ramona Mershon. I uh, am a core member of the Steering Committee for Trauma-Informed Los Angeles and definitely an advocate in diversity work across the nation. So why am I here? I mean, I think it's a very important conversation and I'm honored um, to you know, help Tori and Chanel on this conversation tonight. And so we're gonna go over a few discussion and ground rules and just talking about um, what kind of space we need to create to have this conversation. Okay, uh, Tori and Chanel, did you guys go over the topics tonight? Oh, we did not go over the topics. Trey, can you put the topics up for us before we get started? Somehow. All right, so the topics we're gonna be discussing, obviously you all know, most of you have read the introduction of the book and so, he hits on a couple of different things that will be discussed more in depth later. But the three things that we pulled out that we thought were really, really important are um, this idea of being not racist and how that's a sort of a mask that we all use to be comfortable. Um, the second thing is stereotypes and internalized racism, which is gonna be fun to talk about because Tori and I have very different opinions about it. Um, and the third thing is breaking down walls of denial because those walls have prevented us from having these courageous conversations. And so um, in order for us to grow together, we're all gonna have to let those walls of defense down. And so um, those are our three topics for today. Thank you, Chanel. So ground rules. The first one is to recognize. We all recognize that we must strive to overcome historical and divisive biases, such as racism in our society. Acknowledge. We acknowledge that we are all systemically taught misinformation about our own groups, about members of other groups. We also acknowledge that some of the information we will learn may be uncomfortable and that in, our, in order to grow, you must let down our wall of defense. We're not here to blame. We will not blame ourselves or others for the misinformation we have learned, but we will accept responsibility for not repeating misinformation after we have learned otherwise. Respect, we acknowledge that we are all here at different stages of learning on the content and discussion topics presented. We agree to listen and respond respectfully to each other in our individual experience. No one is required or expected to speak for their entire race. Trust, we trust that everyone has come to the table to learn, grow, and share. We trust that people are doing the best that they can 
receiving information and articulating their thoughts. We know that we're not experts. The facilitators are not experts and we know that no one here is an expert. They are here to help facilitate the process. They and everyone in the group are here to learn. We also recognize that everyone has an opinion. Opinions, however, are not the same as informed knowledge backed up by research. Depending on the topic and the context, both are valid to share, but it's important to know the difference. And can I say something really quickly on that before we move on to the posting guidelines? Absolutely. Um, one of the kind of uncomfortable things for me is I have a weird thing about having conversations in front of people, which is probably surprising for some of you um, who know me, but um, one of the things that we kind of came to this table knowing is that things aren't gonna be perfect. Um, a lot of times we avoid these conversations because we wanna say it the right way. We wanna make sure we're saying the right things all the time. And so having these discussions on Instagram or Twitter are so much easier because you get to edit, delete, you know, make sure you're saying things the right way. And so one of the um, reasons why this is a, really a brave space is because we're all coming here to be authentic. Um, hopefully we'll be as transparent as we can be and that you guys will appreciate that. Um, and that we may say things that are gonna make you uncomfortable and know that the intent is not really to make anyone uncomfortable, but we wanna speak our truth and we wanna make sure we're as authentic as possible. And we know that you guys are all trying your best as well. And so we're not judging your comments. We're not gonna shut down any of your opinions. And we know that everyone brings something different to the table and that's what's gonna make this kind of a, a beautiful experience. And so I just wanted to throw that out there really quickly before you went over the other guidelines. Oh, no, thank you, Chanel. I appreciate that. So posting guidelines. Again, we're here to be respectful. So we want everyone to participate. This is a shared learning environment and your engagement is important to this discussion. If you have any kind of technical difficulties, you know this is an online learning platform. So please report them. Be patient. You know, read everything in the discussion thread before replying. Oftentimes other people are repeating some of the same things that you said, but definitely if you feel it's important to share, we want you to um, participate and be patient in that process. Be brief and be clear and articulate your point. Be direct and stay on point so that we can understand what you're trying to tell us today. Please do not post any inappropriate comments or use any offensive language. Remember, we are here learning together with each other. So to start the conversation, we really, we, we put a poll in the um, comments underneath to ask you, are you racist or anti-racist? So if you could please take a moment to answer that poll while we start that discussion. So Tori and Chanel, uh, did you take the poll and can you tell us a little bit about what you answered? You wanna go first? I can go first. I feel like I'm anti-racist um, and when you, when we talk about the definition of what that means, um, I like to use the example of Chanel and I talked about the other day. Uh, you know where I stand on racism at all times. Um, it doesn't matter who I'm around. I can be around black people. I can be around white people. It doesn't matter. My stance is the same regardless. Um, it's my truth. Um, I live it in my actions as well um, in terms of calling it out when I see it and not tolerating it myself. Um, and it's a, it's a process. I try to educate, I try not to make you feel bad, but I try to make everyone feel aware of it. And what's crazy is when you start to read his book, you have to look even as you realize that racism isn't just about black and white in terms of me being a black man and looking towards other white individuals in terms of their racism, but I have to look at myself in the way I view my own people as well. And I feel like when I think of black people, I think of, uh, there aren't very many stereotypes that I believe exist. I believe that we are capable of doing anything and a stereotype is just that a stereotype um, that may be some people's experience, but it isn't everyone's. And uh, I'm for sure, Chanel's like, are you sure about that? I'm like, yes, I'm firm in saying I'm anti-racist. And we, as you read this amazing book, uh, I'm definitely taking a bold stance, but, um, his definition is very strong and clear and he can for sure have you feeling like you're straddling the line, but I'm firm in my stance right now. <laughs> All right, okay, Tori, we'll see. So uh, we wanna, I wanna backtrack a little bit because just in all of our excitement of starting uh, starting the conversation, um, we forgot to tell you guys about the goal. So um, 
the goal of this conversation tonight is to engage in thoughtful dialogue of what it means to be anti-racist and how we can work towards identifying and dismantling racism and racist structures. So Angela Davis was quoted as saying, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist, we must be anti-racist. So in that conversation, let's talk about a little bit for a minute before we get back to our poll, which we will, um, why are we here tonight? So Chanel, do you wanna tell us a little bit about, you know, why, why are you here tonight? And then we can get into the other conversation. Um, I am here tonight because one, I love having discussions and um, we do that pretty often. One of us does it very nicely, the other one sometimes not so nicely. Um, but I love engaging and getting different people's perspectives because a lot of times we all like to stay in our stance and not hear the other side. Um, and what I've learned over the course of the last couple of years uh, through my Instagram interactions with people is that the more you dialogue, the more you understand each other. Um, and it's super, super simple, but a lot of people have real struggles with doing that. And so a lot of times we are listening to respond and we're not listening to learn. And I thought that this would be a great opportunity for us to all listen to learn. And hopefully at the end of this, someone, even if it's one person has gained a new perspective. Um, and I also wanna learn in the process too, just reading the first couple of chapters of this book, I learned a lot about myself that, you know, I didn't even know was an issue. And so um, I wanna learn, but I also want to just have really good dialogue so that we can understand each other a little bit more um, and hopefully nip this racism thing in a butt a little bit. Um, even if it's one person, like I said, I feel like we've done something great. And so that's why I'm here. Um, and I'm also here because I get a lot of DMs from people telling me that they're scared to have these conversations. Um, they're uncomfortable having these conversations. They don't know how to have these conversations the right, the right, right way, if there is a right way. Um, and so this, di this hopefully this dialogue will help people be more courageous and to own up to what they need to own up to, get over what they need to get over, and for all of us to push forward. So that's why I'm here. Why are you here, you here other than- yeah, Tori, What are you hoping to take away from the discussion today? Like why now? What's prevented you of ha from having these conversations in the past? Well, for Chanel, uh, I don't know. I don't know if she necessarily had the forum. Me, if you've been around me, we've had this conversation before. So um, I just think it's important to continue that conversation. It's not just uh, a safe locker room conversation or a locker room or a conversation that you have with people that think like you or your friends. You know, it's a conversation for everyone and people from different environments as well. And right now is the right time. Great. So for those of you joining us, you know, put in the chat box, what are you hoping to take away from this conversation as we discuss this over the next five weeks? Um, you know, what is, think about what has prevented you maybe from having this conversation in times that you maybe felt uncomfortable. Chino, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think that's the biggest thing. It's important to know why people are here, um, what the intent is, um, and for people to be open and honest about why they haven't been here before. Because really these things have been going on for so long. And so my question is like, why now? I think I kind of know why now, um, but just hearing it from them is important for me to, so I can understand what made them, what made people in general, all of a sudden have this rush to speak up um, and to want to learn I'm a better late than never person, but I know some people, it upsets them. Like, this has been going on for so long. How come you haven't said anything before? Um, and so what about the circumstances today? Was it George Floyd's death? I honestly, truly think that that got a lot of people thinking um, because we've dealt with so many things over the however many years that people didn't see it as clear as day. I think George Floyd's death was clear because it was on video, the entire thing. There was no question, there was no struggle. You saw from start to finish that this was completely unacceptable. And I think, especially for things in the past, we, there's always this question of, well, you know, what was he doing beforehand? Why did he resist? Why did he do that? 
I think this one in particular was just clear as day. And that's why I think people are speaking up for sure. But yeah. Um, it was a combination. We had a week or so apart where we come from talking about a case that we don't understand why an individual wasn't charged. It took for the whole country to see a video for something that we all knew was murder right away. Um, and then you start to learn about the criminal justice system and just flat out racism because those individuals weren't on duty cops. And then you learn about police brutality and things that people have been complaining about for years. And, you know, they were just piled right on top of each other. And I think that's why we're here. You know, it's interesting because they say that society has kind of like an amnesia mindset. And we get over the things that we see within a couple of weeks and going on to the next thing. And Chanel, you and I spoke about this in regards to, okay, we're on to COVID. We're on to injustice. We're on to this, right? And even looking at, you have you know, Maude Aubrey, you have Rihanna Taylor. And then shortly after those things happened, it's like, okay, they kind of died down and we were back on something else. But then you have, you know, this death of, of George Floyd. And like uh, Chanel said, it really kind of ignited the country to really stand up and say, wow, this is a problem as if it had never been a problem before. So let's see where we are with our results. Wow, so we have about, 53% of people saying that they're anti-racist and 45% saying that they're somewhere in the middle. Yeah, we're, we're, we, we have to get back to that. Um, I know someone said that they've been on the path to being anti-racist, um, but just kind of touching the surface of it and they need to dig deeper. I think that is, that's a really uh, honest answer too, because we think we know it, and we think we know what racism um, entails. And I think just reading the first couple chapters of this book, a lot of people are gonna see things a lot differently and realize that racism is not just about calling someone a racial slur um, and that there's so much more to it. So that was, that's, a, that's a pretty... Um, so what else? do you think, is there a middle ground? Um, and then do we need to be comfortable being um, anti-racist? Like, tell me what your thoughts are on that. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I said, there is no middle ground to being anti-racist. What are your thoughts about being comfortable with that? And um, what do you think causes that? The people think thinking that they're not racist. We talked about that earlier when, and it, I don't really understand why it's not that clear. Because when there's something that you truly believe is wrong, like you stand by it no matter what. Like there's, like you said, it's clear cut. I use the example that a lot of Christians, and it means the world to them when we talk about abortion. If you don't believe in abortion, and individuals that don't believe in abortion, they do not waver. There isn't a single thing out there that's gonna, at any point, no matter who they're around, they're gonna let you know that their belief is they don't believe in abortion. And it's very clear. And I feel like when it comes to racism, it's like, oh, well, my aunt just said something that was a little out of line. Or She's still a good person. my boss said something that's a little out of line. Like, no, like <laughs> there needs to be a line drawn in the sand and you have to constantly be against it when you know wrong or something that you may not believe. I think for me, I've never looked at racism as you're either racist or anti-racist. Mm -hmm. Like I never, it's a fairly new concept to me in practice. And so Obviously, I've always known that I'm not racist. Um, but I think the good thing about this book is defining racism. Everyone has a different definition of racism. And right. I think that's the number one problem. Um, and as you can see, what is it? 49% of the people said they're somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a big portion of people who are stuck in this. I'm not racist, but I'm also not doing enough. I'm clearly not doing enough. And so I think it's interesting that that many people did identify with that. Um, but I also think it's just more comfortable to be not racist because I don't have to say anything. I don't have to call people out. I don't have to um, speak on issues when I see them. I can act like there. everyone lives in this you know, great society where no one hates anybody. There's no discrimination. There's no disparities in educational systems and stuff like that. It's almost easier it's kind of like ignorance is bliss. It's almost easier to just not know and to not see it than to address it. Because that means that I would have to address something with myself and with my friends and with my family. 
And so I think it's easier for people to be colorblind and not see race, not see racism. Um, it's been a very common phrase used in my interactions with people that they're, I don't, I can't relate to racism because I don't see race. And mm. so people really wholeheartedly believe that they don't see racism because they don't see race. And that's kind of a problem in, in itself because we have to see race. I see race every single day, every day of my existence, I see race. And I see how people treat me and the, the different things that go along with people of color. And so I really struggle with people saying that they're teaching their kids to be colorblind or they're teaching their kids not to see race at all. Because that means if you're not seeing race, how can you see racism? How can it right. exist? race is not a thing. Um, and I, I've always thought it was kind of a silly topic. I understand the intent. Um, I think the intent is I don't want to raise racist kids. So I'm going to teach them that everyone's the same and not to see any differences in people treat everyone like human beings. So I get the intent, but I think the effects of it can be really harmful. Right. Because what you're really doing is hiding the struggles of the people who are experiencing racism, right? So if we say everyone is equal, but we know there's not equity in society when it comes to African-American people versus necessarily like the, the white culture. So if we look at that, then that's definitely an issue. So as a time such as this, when we can say that society can never go back and say that they don't understand or know the struggles of what's going on right now with African-Americans, how do you think that people can reconcile that being colorblind or saying that everyone is like equal, how do they reconcile that in this journey of being anti-racist? I think it's, honestly, I think it's been, it's not rocket science. Like most people, when I, when I approach it and I say, not, be, not saying you don't see race is ignoring the struggles, the challenges, the, the differences in people. And we teach kids when they're one years old to distinguish between color. Like we have Corey right now sorting all the red things over here, all the blue things over here. And so to say that there's color and there's, there's differences in the world, except when it comes to people, everyone's the same, is kind of a silly topic. I mean, it's a, it's a silly concept. And I think it's, it's, hard, it's hard for people to, um, to address this idea of being colorblind because one, they were taught their whole entire lives. And so when they go out into the world, and I can tell you some of my, co my uh, classmates in college were, it was very clear that they were taught to be colorblind. And when they got to college, their eyes are opened and they're like, wait, this is a thing? And they're shocked. And so for white people, you don't necessarily have to talk about it because the world is kind of built to benefit you and to support you and to represent you. And so for us, we have to talk about it every single day. And with, even with our kids, we have to talk about it because at some point, someone's going to point out race to them. And we can't have them just in this bubble of everyone's the same and then be shocked that somebody said, oh, you're Black, you're different. And then we have a kid who doesn't know how to address that. And so especially in the school that he's in, TJ is one of four Black kids in his entire grade. Um, everything's fine and pretty now. <laughs> Someone on the bus is going to say something. Someone on the playground at some point is going to say something and he's going to be completely shocked. And I know that for a fact because TJ came home and he thought that he had three other black kids in the class with him. And I was like, I just remember real specifically that there was no other black kids in his class. And so, and I noticed that and he just kept saying, no, there's three other black kids. And it was his friend Ayush and someone else. Like he has, he has all these, he has a bunch of different friends. And what I realized is that he thought that everyone with brown skin was African-American, black. And so once he found out that they weren't black, it was just like, wait, so I'm the only one in my class? Like he started thinking of all these different ideas. Like what if, what if all the people who are not black want to play together and not me and, and want to leave me out? And so he started to think about these things right away. And so we have to really build him up so that he doesn't see it as, his race as a, a negative thing and that differences are okay. Um, and I think that if we we're so scared to teach kids too much. Um, and so we say, just ignore this. We do that with, I, I said this on Instagram before with disabilities. We, we tell people, kids don't look, don't ask questions. Everyone's the same. 
And they're like, wait, that person is clearly different, mom. You're telling me not to say anything. Like there's a difference there and it makes them form their own opinions about things. And I think that's- It inhibits, it inhibits our understanding too, right? Yeah. So how do you think that we as a black race are contributing to that, to the stereotypes and the narrative that's in society? How do you think that we're, we're kind of part of the perpetrator, so to speak? I think this is that whole topic of internalized racism that really opened up my eyes in this chapter. Um, Tori, Tori and I struggled with this concept because we always believe like black people can't be racism because we don't have power to do anything. Like even if we do, you know, have these views of not liking white people or this, what are we gonna do with it? Like we can't stop someone from getting a job we can't stop, you know what I mean? Like there's there's no power in our quote unquote hate if we're racist. And so we kind of carried that idea, but we never considered, can we be racist against our own people? And that took some really digging deep for us. And we both, well, Tori right away said that he for sure is not racist against his own people. And so I Googled to see if there was any type of little, little quiz or checklist or anything. And we actually found a quiz and if anybody's interested in it, we'll post it. Um, it's called the internal, uh, internal racism uh, inventory. And a couple of things on that list, I 100% am guilty of. And Tori was guilty of too. And so he can't say that he's 100% anti-racist because he still holds some of these views too. <laughs> None of them I was truly guilty of. There was some I understood. No, you were guilty. I so I want to. I just want to talk about. I want to talk about a couple things. Um, this idea of internalized racism. I know Kendi said in the book that internalized racism is the real black on black crime. Yes. And accepting and normalizing these stereotypes that people have about us is a problem, um, and we struggle with that concept because when it's like we're fighting two battles almost. We're fighting this battle of uh, racism and oppression. And then we're also fighting the battles within our communities that we feel like, like we have to stop these things because we're going along with what they want us to be, what they expect us to be. And so um, the, the questions that we, that we struggled with. So the first one was, we. we struggled with. <laughs> do, I put, do I put on a different persona when I go into white people's business organization or home. Guilty, 100% guilty of that. Are you guilty of that? Or he's not guilty of that, okay. The second one was, am I a harsher critic of the choices or behaviors of people of color than I am of white people? Oh, that was a yes for me, I lied. Yeah. Sure. I think we're all guilty of that, right? Because we hold ourselves at higher standards and if we're able to attain some level of excellence and we're like, why, you know, why can't you do it? And we discount the story and the narrative and the experiences that they've had to live through, right? But we automatically go to, well, why can't you do it? Or why are you like that? Or you're like that because, right? Dot, dot, dot. And then we may say that to somebody who's not a person of color and then further impacting their racist ideas because we're reinforcing them. And they're like, well, if they can say it, then it, we must be right. Exactly. What is what is your thought on that part? I mean, my thought process is I feel like you hold the people that are closest to you to a higher standard, period. Um, like to me, you talk about like if you're out and about and the way you conduct yourself, like when you're conducting yourself like the way your mother raised you, and when you see like that's the expectation when you leave a house. And when you see it and you allow room for a stereotype to exist, like that's kind of what bothers so you me, hold um, the when it comes to just the the outside the outside pressure and, and it's and it's because you know how people you know like when you walk out there's a lens on you you know people are looking at you you know people are judging you and then it just really bothers me when it gives people that that sense of ah there you go just like I expected them to be yeah. you know what I mean and and, and that's why you know I, I would say I'm a harsher critic I I want to apologize very quickly because I'm a little off with this computer thing. We can now see the discussion, <laughs> what you guys are saying. So we haven't been ignoring you guys. I just couldn't locate the chat. Um, Jordan said it right. Um, the world is set up to make black people feel like they have to. And 
one of the things Tori challenged me, I'm gonna read one more question that really hit home to me. It said, how often do we overcompensate going out of our way to contradict or disprove, disprove a stereotype that I think white people may be holding against me? I am so guilty of going out of my way. And it's not that I'm trying to impress a white person. It is to, to show this is how we are. Like the, the image that you have of black people is false. And so I go out my way and Tori thought that this was the most ridiculous thing. And I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about it. When I was pregnant with Corey and we've, we've lived in areas where there's a lot of rich white people straight up. And so the stores that we go to and, and everything is just a lot of rich white people. One of the things that I struggled with was any time that I went out when I was pregnant, my rings didn't fit, my wedding, my wedding rings didn't fit because I was pregnant. I would have TJ and Cam and they you know, were a hot mess. And then I was pregnant again. And when I would go into the store, I don't know if it was an insecurity of mine or what, but my thought was these white people are going to think that I'm some single mom struggling with their kids whose father, the father's not in their lives. And I would go out my way to let people know like their dad's at home waiting for them. Right. And I, I'm like, Tori was like, well, that's ridiculous. Like that's an insecurity that you need to deal with. And I'm like, well, why do I feel like that? Why when I'm on a call for an interview, do I change my voice? And I'm not just saying, enunciating my words. I am changing the tone and the pitch of my voice to sound a certain way for a reason. And maybe it is a little bit of insecurities too, but I'm always thinking of, how some, they're going to perceive me and that I need to prove that, you know, I'm just as qualified. And Tori, you do this too. And he's so guilty in, in settings when we're like uh, in corporate events and talking about ha feeling like you got to drop your credentials so that they know. I only do, see, this is where we, this is where she just runs with it so she can try to feel like I'm in this with her because I'm not on that. <laughs> um, okay. You know, like if if I'm out and about, like with me, what you see is what you're gonna get. And if it's a situation where a person comes to me and we're talking about it, I have no problems telling you my credentials beyond football. But but Tori but and I understand when and I put it out there if I sense that someone's trying to question why I'm in the room. That's when I'll put it out there. I don't go and just voluntarily throw it out there to feel like I belong. I feel like I belong because I'm alive. And I don't have to prove anything to anyone like I'm enough. That's the so way So Tori feel. is, Tori is, I will agree that he is very much like that. But I told him he's in a position where a lot of people know him and love him. And so he has free reign to be who he is because people aren't necessarily judging him right away. Like they know Tori Smith, the athlete, they know Tori, they know who he is. So he's had a little more freedom to say what he wants, to be what he wants, to wear Crocs to a meeting and no one judge him because he's an athlete. So that's a privilege that he has that the average black person can't go into a meeting. What not wear Crocs to a meeting? I'm just saying, you could. <laughs> Don't put that out there. Don't put that out there. If you did, if you did, people are going to give you a pass like Tory with his locks. All of a sudden, everyone loved his locks, but the average black man on the street, people look down on locks and they think it's, you know, a certain type of person wears those locks. So because Tori has been in a position to be, be able to be himself, it's, I think it's easy for him to say, I don't care what people think. I don't care about stereotypes. I don't think about those things. And so I think it's a, it's but, a different but experience. But that's not true. I literally live in a, I, at the NFL combine, I was asked by multiple people about my hair. I didn't give a damn what they thought. Excuse your language. Like my, but, you, but my, Tori, you also have to realize that, and if you have your hair in locks and you're driving through a neighborhood where people don't know Tori Smith, you know I, the I, NFL I, football player, right? Then you said what now? Guns drawn on me by police officers four times. Right, and I saw we Chanel and I spoke about this about how when you asked your friends when's the first time you had a gun pulled out on you, and then. Everybody was so shocked at what the results were, right? So that kind of takes us into our next topic, last topic of today about denial. And Candy says, denial is the heartbeat of racism, right? What are we in denial about? 
I don't think I'm in denial about anything. Um, I think we struggle with separating these stereotypes that we have and that we know are alive and well and just dealing with it. So I know one of the conversations that we had when we listed all those things, someone put in there that their black coworker, when he emails his kid's school, he makes sure he emails from his work email. Um, in a similar situation, when, when we're showing up to a conference for TJ, I'm making sure Tori's there every single time. I want to be there, by the way. He, of course he wants to be there, but there's a no, there's like, it's non-negotiable, non-negotiable. He has to be there because I want them to make, I want to make sure they know that he has a father in his life that really cares about him and that their, their image of black people and black men is wrong. Um, and so one of the things I struggle with is why is it that negative stereotypes for black people get applied to the entire race? Right. Whereas stereotypes about white people don't. And so like the example that I gave, people think that, you know, black people or black men are aggressive and violent. That's just, that's a very common stereotype. Right. Black equals danger. Yeah. Danger equals danger. And so they apply, you know, maybe experiences with black people, negative experiences to the entire race where I know for me, like if there's a, a school shooting and it's a white person, I'm not leaving the next day thinking like every white man that I see is going to blow up a school. Like right. I know, I never apply that, but I had to check myself because after 9-11, when I was on airplanes, I for sure had feelings about certain people. And I had to check myself, why is it with non-Black people, do we apply the stereotype to every single person in the race, but when it comes to white people, we don't do that. Right, because they're given, they're given a grace automatically, I think due to the kind of that narrative and the oppression that's been placed on us for over 400 years, right? So we have to give them grace because they're the dominant culture, but there's no grace given to us on the other side. So we, we talk a little bit about, about what are they struggling with in regards to the white race and being fragile when we try to like address that with people in their privilege. Like, well, how are they struggling with their privilege? What do you think is going on? It's, it's uncomfortable for people to accept something that they feel like they didn't do. Yeah. So and that's a natural thing. I feel like I've I've heard. Well, my family didn't own slaves, or my family's from up north, so they didn't really deal with segregation. Or my family's from Germany; they aren't from here. Period. Right. Um, I think when you see it and listen to other people's experiences, like it's tough because because some people it feels like that's their reason for their success like the only reason for their success. Like it takes away, like they're only living in a good neighborhood. Like they only have a good job because they're white. Like mm -hmm. that's not 100% the truth. Right. But your race has never been a barrier for you. Right, exactly. And to talk about that, it's never comfortable. So I think it's more so important for people to acknowledge that, that that's, the, that's the reality of it. I can tell you guys about a debate that I have with one of my teammates in the locker room. Uh, and we were talking about just like, he's like, well, there are no laws that says black people can't do this or that. So right. why is it that in, in since the Jim Crow era? Um, and I was like, he was like, my grandfather came here, he worked extremely hard and he wasn't a rich man, but he worked hard. He provided for my parents and they worked hard and they were educators and they provided for me. And then obviously I earned a scholarship. And I was like, well, when your grandfather came here and started a fresh life, my grandfather came back from the wars and couldn't even eat in the same restaurant. So like there are barriers and, and he couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. He couldn't get loans. They were being red like There were different things that were happening mm -hmm. that hold people back. And we're talking about something that impacted our grandparents. Right. <laughs> like it's not like it was like a hundred, 200 years ago. So right. we talk about slavery, but really we talk about the ripple effect. And I think oftentimes we have to point people to things that are like, right here because when you say 400 years that just automatically tunes an individual out mm -hmm. like that's so long ago like i'm not responsible for that but when you talk about like the recent timeline of things that we know exist um things are clear and it i think people are a lot more open-minded yeah. to listening. when we posted the ruby bridges thing and the fact that that was in 1960 mm -hmm. not too long ago she just turned 65 
was born in 1965. Like she's still like Ruby Bridges is still like going. She's younger than my grandma. Or the interracial marriage thing ending in Alabama. Thousand. Like that is not. We were all most of us. If you're on here, you were alive during that time. And so I think the other thing about privilege that's really hard with people, they think it's a personal attack on them specifically. Like you're you're personally attacking me and accusing me of something that's not true. You didn't choose to have privilege. You didn't, you were born into privilege. It wasn't something that you said, I'm gonna take this privilege and I'm gonna leave these people out to dry. Like, and so people think it's a personal attack on them, and it's not. Like they think of it as some negative, you know, some negative word that means that they're racist or that they, you know, that they, they were, didn't work they were just, everything was given to them. It was them. just given to them. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. And that's why people really struggle. But when you give the basic things about privilege, the basic um, checklists, and people can check them off, like if the shoe fits, wear it, it's okay. People like to throw back at Tori and I, like, well, you're privileged, you have money. Well, we didn't grow up privileged, but our kids are going to grow up privileged. Yes, because we have money, but it has nothing to do with the color of the skin. They're still going to be treated like black people. Just um, like Tori said, three times, right? So regardless of having money and having privilege, where you are and who you are, if, if it doesn't matter, people will still, you know, mistreat you. They will still discriminate against you. So mm-hmm. it, it has us thinking, why is it so hard for people to believe that racism is such a huge problem in our society today? Why does it take a George Floyd death, eight minutes, 46 seconds of somebody kneeling on his neck to get people to wake up? Yep. And Matt said it perfectly in the chat. He said, privilege isn't about what you have gone through, but rather what you haven't had to go through. Yeah. That's the, it's so hard for people to, it's like they don't believe black people when they share their experiences. And I have felt that way. Like what I'm saying, you're thinking that I'm making this stuff up, that I wake up every day thinking about these things, that I go into grocery stores, thinking about how people are going to perceive me, that I have to change my voice when I'm on the call, that I'm thinking about how some of my black friends' names on their resume is going to detract people from hiring them. They think that we're making up these experiences. And if you don't ever have to think, if you wake up and never have to think about how your color is going to impact your day or your life, then that's privilege. And it's not something that you chose. You weren't, you didn't choose to be born white. Um, But it's something that we have to get comfortable saying. Like I'm comfortable saying that my kids are going to be more privileged than we were. I don't feel like it's a negative thing against me personally. It is facts. It is what it is, right? You shouldn't feel guilty for your kids having some privilege because you worked hard to get to where you are. So it's like, we almost feel like we have to apologize for getting somewhere in life or apologize if our kids are successful because you know we have to apologize to our race for getting where we are. And, and that has, again, it has to do with our own internal struggle with where we are on that racism, on the racism spectrum. So even I see just going back for a second because I we see a comment here that um, someone said that Jennifer that you know you want to think back to your childhood and how kids came to your school in the suburbs from the city and you re- wanted to realize how hard it was for them and I think that's part of the part of the issue and not say I won't say problem because we're not you know blaming but per se it's like we don't realize we don't think we're not taught to think about how other people feel or what they experience because it's not impacting us right. right. We don't want to think of ourselves as bad people, like, oh my God, I'm not racist. I'm a good person. I'm nice. And I volunteer here and I do this and I have black friends. So I'm not racist, but there's a situation which we'll get into next week. Right. So just to say that, that I think that, you know, so final thoughts just about the whole denial piece. And then Chanel, you can go into our homework. Uh, final thoughts about denial. Um, one of the things that we talked about here is coming to listen and to learn. And when someone is accusing you of something that you didn't believe to be true, the first thing you do is to get defensive. Like that's a natural thing. When Tori accuses me of something that I didn't do, I get really, really upset. And even if you did it. And sometimes I did it and didn't realize that I was doing it. And so we have to we have to stop being quick to say, I'm not racist. What are you talking about? I don't see color. I don't do these things and start really examining little bits and pieces in our lives that um, may be contributing to this racism racism thing. 
Um, and so when we get into the reflections and stuff, that's going to be really important. But there was one more point that I wanted to talk about um, with, what was it? What was it? Oh, I wanted to say something else while she was looking for a point about privilege. Thank you. Go ahead on. Um, like, I, because we, our, our kids are going to be privileged because of wealth and money. Um, mm -hmm. but, and that's why, like, when I'm talking to uh, my white friends, I'm like, I feel like I don't understand why people feel personally attacked. Like, I feel like you're only in the wrong if you don't understand your privilege. Like, if you're acting like it, it doesn't exist and you don't understand it, that's when I think it's wrong. Me, I don't feel guilty at all. You know, because oftentimes, like, and so in, in putting the shoes to a white individual, I wouldn't feel guilty for the privilege that I have or experience, but I'm not gonna act like that doesn't impact the next individual, right? Um, and so that's one thing that I think that we can all try to be comfortable in um, and understanding that look, it, there's no need for you to feel guilty. That's when the attack, that's when the personal feeling happens. Yeah. Come, but it is what it is, right? you know? But I mean, I don't think you should ever feel guilty for your success or the position that you're in, because you work for it. Or if it was handed to you, it doesn't matter. It's your opportunity, right? <laughs> You right. Should never feel guilty for it, but you should understand that it is the same for everyone else. Yeah. And I think along those lines, I'm not one of the people who are saying, like, why are you just now figuring this out? Like, you've been living in this world this whole time. You have, I don't care where you came from to this point. Like, we are taking things for what it is and where we're all at. And so, things you didn't know before, for example, I think the topic of am I racist or not is hard because everyone has so many different definitions of racism. And so a lot of people think that racism is just saying racial slurs and, you know, hating people. And so, of course, I'm going to say I'm not racist because I don't hate anybody. I don't right. hate just because of the color of their skin. But not knowing about the structural and the systemic racism is preventing people from seeing the big picture. And so as we read this book, it's no longer ignorance is bliss. Like you are now your eyes are open to, oh, racism is so much deeper than calling somebody the N word. It's so mm -hmm. much deeper than that. And looking at yourself and saying, crap, like I have been maybe not doing those things, but I'm going along with it and accepting it and 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 it's receiving the benefits of it. And so as we read and we really define what it means to be racist, that's going to be key. And somebody just put, <laughs> it's hard to have these conversations with white people. And I know I probably do it too much. They call it white, white explaining. I think is that that's the new term. Yes, yes. Kind of put it in a way that's going to make you feel really, really comfortable and not feel attacked and to say it really, really nicely and to be understanding and patient. And I'm a teacher. And so naturally I, I do those things. Yeah, I'm not good. Tori doesn't, not, not so great at it. Um, but we have to stop being scared to say the things we really want to say, black people and white people. Because what I've have found is that a lot of white people are scared to say what they really want to say or a question they really want to have because they don't want to be attacked. And they, well, they feel they're going to say it the wrong way or they're going to offend somebody. Like uh, it's a whole spectrum, right? You have to say the things and maybe you will be attacked. And people are like, I, that's why I shouldn't have said anything because now I feel attacked. Well, welcome, welcome to the world. Like, you know, we, we have to put on our big pants, our big boy pants and big girl pants and be like, all right, I may say things that, that may be received a really bad, you know, the way that I didn't intend and I have to deal with those things. But if you don't say it, we won't know it. You know what I mean? So we have to, in order for us to understand each other and each other's perspectives, we have to be open and honest. And so say what you feel and, and obviously we're not being disrespectful, but if you have a, a, a dying question, then, then ask it and maybe we can get to the root of it. And then that also goes along with, you know, there's a, a post going around like, it's not black people's jobs to educate you. And I do agree with that. Like there's Google, like some people ask me really, really silly questions that I'm like, you could have Googled that. But for me, I'm like, I'm going to take this opportunity to educate and learn with you. And so let's take this opportunity and really learn and grow together um, right. because not everyone's going to be as patient <laughs> and as open to educate and to learn together. But I think this space here should be a safe space for us to do that together. Um, so as we move into the reflections, we'll have one final quote. And it is the beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism 
to be an anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself. And it's the only way forward. Ramona, can you can you read page 10? Because we, we both highlighted that last page of- uh, Yes, I have it. We thought was really important. A lot of people, and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people saying they've had hard times having these conversations with their family. I know so many people who have messaged me like, I didn't want to put this on your post because I was scared to get backlash from my friends and family, but this is how I really feel. So you're like in, in private trying to be anti-racist, but you're not because you're scared to, to, to say stuff to the, the closest people around you. So if we can't start with ourselves and our own homes. How are we going to change it, you know, in the world? Okay. So um, if you guys, if you have the book in, on page 10, it ends like this. This book is ultimately about the basic struggle we're all in, the struggle to be fully human and to see that others are fully human. I share my own journey on being raised in the dueling racial consciousness of the Reagan era black middle class, then right turning into the 10 lane highway of anti-black racism, a highway mysteriously free of police and free on gas and veering off into the two lane highway of anti-white racism where gas is rare and police are everywhere before finding and turning down the onlit dirt road of anti-racism. After taking this grueling journey to the dirt road of anti-racism, humanity can come upon the clearing of a potential future, an anti-racist world in all its imperfect beauty. It can become real if we focus on power instead of people, if we focus on changing policy instead of groups of people, it's possible if we overcome our cynicism about the permanence of racism, we know how to be racist. We know how to pretend to be not racist. Now let's see how to be anti-racist. Yeah, I mean, that's Ballers. real. <laughs> that's real. Um, I think we, as we get into these next chapters, things are gonna become super, super clear. Um, especially with all the definitions and all that fun stuff. And we are on this journey to where you're on a journey too. You are not fully anti-racist yet. Um, I'm as close as you get. I don't think anyone's going to ever be fully anti-racist. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, but I'm as close as you get. Tori thinks he's as close <laughs> as he can get. But we have to continue to have these conversations. And can we put up the reflection questions? Somebody asked about... This, this is kind of random, but talking about using the N-word in music, it's kind of like off topic, but just really quickly, we try, huh? I said way off topic. Way off topic, sorry. <laughs> if you don't, this, uh, the reason why I'm, I'm bringing it up is because kids are going to follow our lead. And if we're teaching them not to be racist, not to use the N-word, not to do these things, but we're still not there ourselves and we're doing it ourselves, it's kind of contradictory. So if we want our kids to be not racist and to not you know, use these words and not to do these things, we literally have to show them the way. And so now everyone is trying, I think everyone's goal in life is that beautiful anti-racist society. Like we all hope and wish that our kids can grow up not in this state, like we can, they can grow up and, and it'd be a beautiful thing. But if we're not doing the work now within ourselves, how are we expecting them to just magically be these beautiful anti-racist people? Um, so we have to do whatever we want our kids to do. We have to lead the way, so. Absolutely. Yeah. That wasn't a bad question. That was, there are no bad questions in that here. It doesn't exist. It'll take us into next week though, our definitions. We can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, let's put up the reflection questions for next week. Oh, we have to push play. All right, so our homework. Everyone read the introduction. If you didn't read the introduction, it's not that long. Um, but before you go into your, some people are already reading the whole book, but before you go on to our next required reading, think about these things. And I'm gonna send these out in our, on the Insta, or Instagram, and I'm gonna send it out via email. Um, the first question is, can we openly and honestly acknowledge and name our own racist behaviors and attitudes? 
So before you say very quickly, I don't have any, let's, let's dig a little deeper. You can acknowledge that you have some type of racist thought or behavior or attitude. Um, write it down so that you can see it because if you're unaware of it within yourself, how are you gonna change it? Um, like I said, I had to, after 9-11, I had to go back and say, what about, what about it is making me apply this one isolated situation to a whole group of people? And I had to really do the work within myself to, to stop that from happening. Um, the second reflection question, which I just lost. Um, think of a time when you had a negative thought about someone, a non-white person. Where do you think this thought originated? We all have thoughts. We, we cannot sit here and act like we don't have biases. We do. We all do. Everyone. Where do those thoughts originate? If you had this idea in your head that black men are dangerous, where did you learn that? Was it an experience that you had with one black person or two black people? Was it the media? What was it, the movies? Is it the music? Like what, where did that thought originate? Was it your family who literally told you that black men are dangerous? Right. Um, it's important to identify things so that we can dismantle them. Like we can't change things if we're not addressing exact things. We can say in general, like I've had some thoughts. No, what was the thought and where did it come from? Um, and then the last thing, what is the first step that you personally will take in striving to be anti-racist? How will you check yourself and hold yourself accountable if you notice that you or someone else is being racist? This is all important things because we can talk about racism, we can talk about what we wanna do, but if we don't have a plan to how we're gonna identify it and how we're gonna address it and change it, then we're gonna get nowhere with this conversation. So these are all reflections that you can keep personal to yourself. I'm gonna post these questions up on Instagram. If you're comfortable sharing your thoughts, then we'll do that. Um, but if not, this is, it's really an inner thing. We're starting with ourselves and our families and our neighborhoods. And then hopefully this beautiful anti-racist movement will infiltrate into the world. But um, yeah, and Chanel, as they're reading, we really would love for you guys to give us kind of like what your insights are on the next uh, chapters that Chanel is gonna go over in regards to the schedule, just to kind of give us some insight into where you are and we'll try to touch upon those themes um, in the coming weeks. And a lot of people have been um, struggling to get the book. So your best place, well, the most the most instant place is just getting the book on your phone um, and downloading in that way. But also uh, we had our luck by actually going to the store. Um, yeah. It was in the store. So I guess, not I guess, I know because of the climate we're in, his book is selling like hotcakes. So yeah. Um, if you want to join in, is there? Um, you can listen on the audio book, or you can just join for the discussion. You don't even have to read the book. Uh, what's that? Read the book. Yeah. What was that thing we had? Uh, with Cliff Notes. <laughs> yeah. Read the book. Read the book. <laughs> Cliff Notes or whatnot. Uh, now you'll learn from the points here. Get Cliff to. Notes. Cliff Notes. Oh my goodness. Use a lot. Somebody just mentioned too as another resource. I meant to mention this earlier. There is the the Harvard University Implicit Bias Test. IAT, yes. Google it and, and take it in this time. You'll be surprised at your results. Um, and I'll post that on you Instagram post as well. Your I'll post my results. It may be a personal thing. So <laughs> a couple of things, the internalized racism inventory, I'm going to post a link to that. The implicit bias test, test is important to do. And then these reflection questions so we can keep the conversation going will be important. Um, next week, yeah, next week we have a couple chapters to read. Do we have a slide on that for the next reading for next week? Yes, we do. So next week we are reading chapters one through five. There's a lot of material in there. We're going to pull the most popular themes within it or the most important themes that we think are, you know, important to hit on. And then we're going to discuss those topics. Um, we're going to try to be as open and honest as possible. Now that we got this first one out of the way, I was a little nervous about like not saying the right thing. I think we're, this is going to be a really good discussion now that we can, we know how to use the discussion feature. <laughs> we can see all of your thoughts and stuff. So that's really cool. But we appreciate you guys for, for coming on tonight. Ramona, we appreciate you. Ramona's You're an awesome facilitator. Ramona, can you um, tell them where they can reach you? Social media, information. 
Oh, definitely. Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn, Ramona Mershon, and also on, uh, what is it, Instagram, USC MSW. Uh, as you can see, our little uh, Google poll was from USC. I'm in the doctorate program there. So <laughs> anyway, I uh, love my Trojans. But yes, you can definitely reach me there or at Mershon at USC.edu. Yep. And you know where to find us. I'm Chanel Smith 22, Tori Smith WR. Maybe we should have created a page just for these discussions so that like my personal feed is maybe get a little out of control. Nope. Keep it on that personal. Okay. Feed. People need this. more people need to see. Need to see Tori, the Tori wanted 4,000 emails. So I don't know. <laughs> well, we can't keep. Even can't keep running and hiding. Like, right. I absolutely agree. Absolutely. Agree. We also can't compartmentalize this topic, right? It needs to be out there in the open for everybody to see and contribute. Yeah. And we're going to lose followers, friends, family in the process, but it is what it is. They'll, they'll come around at some point. Um, so I will send out these questions if you need them in your email. If not, head to my social media page. We're going to continue the conversation. And next time, invite your friends. We didn't, I, I didn't post it on purpose early because I'm like, I just want this first one to go really smoothly. I don't want a bunch of people coming, but now... We got our jitters out. Well, I got my jitters out because he's never nervous. Um, I think we're, we're going to have some more. We can invite more people next time. So share. We'll save this. Um, this will be saved, right? I think this will be saved, right, Ms. Ruma? Yeah, I believe so. It should, it should be saved, um, and he should be able to repost it. You can also post it to your other, uh, other sites. Okay. Right. Well, appreciate y'all joining, and we'll see y'all same time next week. Same time next week. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Thank you, Ms. Rona. All right. Bye-bye. Yes, Devin, message me to be if you want to be added.